an institute for providing a great opportunity to have this uh, good and uh, fruitful cooperation between your students here in the university and I think many of you uh, been involved in such program earlier and uh, an NGO which they can be like a bridge between the theoretical part of the educational curriculum and what's happening outside this boundary of this university. So the, the, we can be involved together and make certain cooperation technically, educationally and at the same time we are coming from the field, you are coming from the uh, educational institution where can provide it so many theories or explore so many theories and not just looking for the problems but find out the solutions. For that reason, we selected uh, with the coordination of Lucy. Thank you very much for your cooperation, Lucy. And, and she done a great job to facilitate all this uh, uh, program with us and with Dr. Simon Mabon that he was really pioneer to guidance how we can come up with this cooperation. So uh, we've been through a certain interview, almost uh, uh, five students, the candidate themselves for the program, and after the interview, uh, we selected three with us here, this three, and today they will uh, give you a short uh, of, the, of what project they worked on. We selected three different topics, and you have it here in front of you. And today, uh, Ethan and Laura and Mumina, they will present the outcome of their projects and the reports they worked on. One of them, in short, it is about what, what the effect of Brexit has happened at the last stage on the UK foreign policy, especially the relationship with the GCC, Gulf Corporation Council in general, and particularly Bahrain. So, we're going to have the first topic to be discussed today by uh, Ethan. And the second one we will discuss on the view of the G20 summit. You know, there is an international summit called G20, which again next year going to be in Saudi Arabia. How and what is their view toward any reforms or any transition of the uh, different changes in the region, particularly in Bahrain and the uh, other of GCC countries, what they done, what is their view and their vision on it. And here the Laura, uh, and she gonna explore it. And the last one, there is a mechanism adopted by Human Rights Council called UPR, Universal uh, Periodic Review. This is where they can make review of the human rights condition in any particular, and this review it is averaged between four to five years, a cyclic one. So Mumina, uh, she worked on the Bahrain case, and, and now we are in the midterm of Bahrain UPR, a midterm. Then we can evaluate it, how it was the performance, and so on. And uh, today, what we're going to the end of the student, they're going to present their report as a summary one, within 10, 15 minutes. One of our structures that he was following up with that intern, he gonna have a comments between five to seven minutes. Then we gonna leave the floor maybe within seven to ten minutes to you to bring your question, your comments, and so on. Then we gonna go next to the next, next, next. The first uh, presentation, we have a live streaming to one of the channels, Lulu channel, and at the same time in our social media, Twitter accounts, and our uh, YouTube account, we are uh, live streaming at least the first one. The other two, it will be not uh, live stream and so on. So I can introduce Ethan if you can come and present your work. Thank you. All right. Um, first things first, sorry for the format, it's not meant to be like that, but I have a lot of time to source it, and I don't know how to source it, so I'll make do. Okay, so my report focused on the impact of, uh, of Brexit on the UK's foreign policy towards Bahrain. Uh, I wrote this report, well, I finished writing this report a few weeks ago. Obviously, since then, Brexit has changed, to say the least. Uh, the, this presentation was written a few days ago, and Brexit has again changed since then. Presumably, Brexit will keep changing, so the report may may contain a few inaccuracies which are unavoidable because I can't see the future. Okay, 
Okay, uh, four main reasons as to why the question is relevant. First of all, Brexit represents what is arguably the biggest political crisis since the end of the Second World War in the UK, that is. Making any question relating to Brexit uh, worth researching. Second, uh, Brexit holds particular implications for the UK's foreign policy. It has been uh, warned by various former politicians and a former head of MI6 even, which is very rare, that the UK's influence will decrease. So any um, investigation into Brexit and the UK foreign policy is worthwhile. Third, uh, Bahrain represents an interesting case study due to the closeness of the UK and Bahrain. So any relate any of the UK and Bahrain's foreign po um, relationship is worthwhile. And finally, the future of Bahrain is itself unclear. So research into that is worth. Uh, it is impossible to know exactly how Brexit will play out, as I outlined uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, therefore, this report will address the three, pro uh, the three possible outcomes, deal, no deal, and a further delay. Uh, the consequences of these options can't be known for sure, but uh, their probable consequences can be, and then uh, the report does not comment on the likelihood of a deal, no deal, or a further deal, or their desirability. The UK's foreign policy is... Uh, as always, affected by the UK's perceived national interest. This is not necessarily the same as its national interest, but, it's, but it is what, effect, what affects our policy. With that in mind, uh, trade, the UK does approximately £550 billion worth of international trade. A million pounds of that was done with Bahrain, so trade and trade concerns have a relatively minor impact on foreign policy. Talk to Bahrain, that is, at the moment. Uh, energy. Uh, it has been argued that oil represents the primary economic concern um, for all Western European countries uh, regarding the Middle East. However, energy, uh, regarding to energy, there is relatively little oil in Bahrain, so energy plays a relatively minor role there. And uh, another interest is that security and military. Bahrain is a key ally of the US and therefore of the UK. This will likely continue to be important, if not come, become more important. Due to the role, uh, due to the situation regarding Iran. Uh, similarly, geopolitics, uh, Bahrain does have a small population and a relatively small economy, but it's very important due to its location and its demographic cup. Uh, this is like to grow in importance, as I said, due to, the, uh, due to the situation regarding Iran at the moment. Finally, uh, the UK government doesn't see itself as having an interest uh, in promoting democracy. This is not because it doesn't, really, it does not see itself as having one. That perception could change should the government change, which is obviously quite possible at the moment, or if the government were merely to take a different view. Okay, so uh, regarding no deal, um, there are contrasting economic prediction, predictions. It is not the job of this report to judge which of those predictions is more likely. It is merely to outline the consequences of those predictions should they come true. With that in mind, however, there is a wide deal would be very damaging. As you can see, uh, predictions of a 1.2% recession sorry, in the first year, followed by 1.5% the next, approximately 500,000 fewer jobs, £50 billion pounds, uh, less investment, 8 to £10 billion pounds lower tax revenue, 20% food price rises, and an overwhelming of UK ports. It has been suggested that this any Brexit, including a no-deal Brexit, will result in positive implications such as increase in wages, improved public finances, and more relevant regulation that any Brexit is still a good thing. Should a no deal prove as damaging as the consensus uh, believes it to be, then the UK will become less focused on protect, uh, promoting human rights due to the fact that there will be, the government will be focused on dealing with the economic problems. Uh, they might even be prepared to cut down on programmes to promote human rights due to uh, attempts to save money and balance the books uh, or to secure trade deals with countries such as Bahrain. However, should a no deal prove not to the impact will be relatively minimal and the UK's foreign policy will continue to be the same, which is to turn a blind eye to the, uh, Bahrain, uh, to the human rights abuses in Bahrain. There we go. Um, regarding a deal, uh, most evidence appears that uh, any deal will represent a degree of continuity, meaning that human rights, uh, the, uh, the support for human rights will continue at roughly the same level. Should be noted, I wrote that sentence before Boris Johnson's deal became chlorine, before it existed. More research is necessary now that the deal can be analysed in depth. However, uh, broad outlines can be made. Uh, should a deal represent continued cooperation, the UK policy will continue to be the same. Should the deal not represent that continuation, then the UK will have 
more closely to the US and as a result will become less focused on promoting human rights abroad, uh, in Bahrain that is. Further, uh, there are three areas in which uh, there is uncertainty, based, uh, three types of uncertainty rather. First, uh, it's unsure what the UK's desire relationship with the EU is going forwards. Uh, it has three options basically. Uh, first is integrated player. In this scenario it still participates in EU foreign policy uh, and security making structure. Uh, in that case our policy will continue to be the same as it is at the moment presumably. Uh, an associated partner is the second option. Uh, the UK will integrate itself in that scenario on a case-by-case -case basis. If that's the case the UK may opt in regarding Bahrain. It may opt out. We can't say at the moment. And third and finally a uh, detached observer work alongside you on a case-by-case -case basis but will not be integrated. This would represent a significant change in foreign policy and as a result we can assume this would result in a significant change in our relationship towards Bahrain and our policy on human rights. Uh, another area of uncertainty, as I said there were three, uh, the government may not be successful in achieving its deal, uh, its desired aim, in which case none of those would potentially come true and it is unclear what the UK's policy will be in any area of foreign policy. Should also be noted that regardless of the outcome, Brexit has, as I'm sure you've noticed, effectively displaced all non-Brexit matters in public uh, political discourse. So there's been no ability to shift the focus um, relating to Bahrain. So it's continuing to remain the same until such time as we move past going on about Brexit. The impact now produced, it is necessary to outline the impact of Brexit on the UK's perceived national interest. Relating to trade, uh, should a trade deal be made with the GCC countries, um, then the UK will, or the UK were to remain in the customs union or the EU, the EU uh, trade will decline in importance because there won't be anything to negotiate, either because we can't or because we've already negotiated it. However, if, uh, we, quit, if we do leave the EU and don't quickly sign a trade deal, then uh, trade will remain if not increase. Uh, regarding energy, um, if the EU moves towards decarbonisation, uh, and the UK does not, the UK would be more concerned about fossil fuel energy such as oil, such as gas, than it would be if it had remained in the EU. Security, military, geopolitics, that will remain roughly the same due to the fact the EU has very little past relating to foreign policy, so living will have no direct impact on our foreign policy. Democracy promotion, uh, the aims of the UK post Brexit have been announced and they do say that there will be a support for um, democracy and human rights abroad. Uh, it's not clear, though, if that's just political rhetoric or a real and honest statement of aims. So now it's time to focus on the future of British-Bahraini relations uh, and to answer the question of whether or not the UK will become less inclined to express concern about human rights issues in Bahrain. Um, I should note at this point uh, some of the facts that I'm about to, some of the views, um, etc. I'm about to state relate specifically to Brexit, other and more underlying general facts about British foreign policy. Okay, so the arguments indicating the UK will be less inclined to express concern are as follows. First, the UK is very likely to be vulnerable to threats relating to trade. Uh, we can already see this. The US and China appear to have tried to use trade as a lever regarding the decision to involve, whether or not to involve Huawei in the construction of the UK's 5G network. Uh, also, even if the UK did want to express concern, there is no guarantee that this would be effective. So that's a question that needs to be answered. Um, also, there is an, it is entirely possible the UK will judge it doesn't want Bahrain to be a democracy. We can see similar fa uh, things happening in Iraq uh, in 2003. Um, furthermore on this, uh, if Bahrain were to become a democracy, it would not necessarily hold views that are to those held by the UK or the UK government. Uh, specifically, uh, the Arab Opinion Index showed that about 25% of respondents viewed Israel as the greatest threat whilst a similar survey in the UK found that Russia, China and North Korea were viewed as the greatest threat uh, against 27%. So there's clearly a differing of opinions on that. Finally, the EU does not take coercive action against states that used to be uh, colonies of EU member states. The UK presumably supports this policy because it never challenged it when it was a member of the EU, so it will presumably have a similar policy, even if it's only an official policy once we have left the European Union. Uh, and arguably the UK isn't going to impose sanctions on anybody post-Brexit because they would be too busy dealing with economic consequences, which I mentioned earlier. But some arguments indicating the UK is more inclined to express concern. Um, these are as follows. Uh, recent government publications have stated that the government 
is committed to supporting human rights defenders abroad, and that will presumably include in Bahrain, as it would be illogical to only apply that selectively. Um, there is also support present among key members of government and of the opposition. I should note that this um, research was conducted when Theresa May was the Prime Minister. Obviously, ministers have changed since then. I couldn't at the time conduct research into their views because they hadn't been ministers long enough for a record to be established. They have now. Further research should be conducted on that. Um, furthermore, MPs themselves appear to be concerned about the matter. Uh, the subject was raised 22 times in 2019, 15 times in 2016. In just at, uh, in the time after the referendum and 15 times before the referendum. Uh, however, it should be noted that a large number of these were made in the House of Lords and indeed a large number of those were made by a single Lord, which is Lord Scriven. Uh, that may well be due to the fact that, as I said earlier, Brexit is stifling political debate on everything other than Brexit, which means that the House of Commons has not time to debate matters relating to Bahrain. Certainly not in the depth that we would like. Um, Finally, the government may well, uh, sorry, has a commitment to publish a British Bill of Rights. Uh, should it do this, and should this be more popular than the current legislation, they may be forced to take a more human rights orientated foreign policy. I uh, should be clear, this is not because any British Bill of Rights would include a foreign policy element, merely because um, a popular commitment to human rights might produce, hmm, might produce domestic pressure to be seen to be doing more abroad. Uh, that does, however, assume that the British Bill of Rights would be more popular than the Human Rights Act and the European Convention on Human Rights, which it would replace. There is no guarantee that would be the case. So, in conclusion, uh, the report has found that the arguments more to express concern are less uh, are weaker, as they can be more easily dismissed. Um, as you can see, uh, this is because the government, whilst it would be a logical apply it to see if supporting human rights abroad in a selective manner and not apply it to Bahrain. Uh, also, the political pressure, as I just mentioned, is being created by a single lord and is unlikely to be very effective. Uh, and finally, the, the UK's government's reaction to political pressure following the publication of a British Bill of Rights is unclear and it may well uh, result in increased support of human rights. However, uh, there are, as I said, I've just said, there are arguments indicating the UK will be more inclined to express concern post uh, Brexit about human rights. Organisations such as Salam and other NGOs concerned about human rights abroad should take advantage of these to push their case to force the government and the opposition to keep uh, to make good on its uh, commitments. And finally, Brexit will have little direct impact uh, due to the EU's limited response. However, it could have a potentially very significant one due to the economic consequences that may well result. Finally, this report has a series of recommendations. It is necessary to conduct more research on the economic consequences of the various forms of Brexit and then to campaign to avoid the most damaging of those. Uh, a concentrated campaign is also necessary to ensure that the government and the opposition remain committed to uh, promoting democracy and human rights and follow through on these commitments with policies as opposed to merely using the means to get votes. Um, it is also necessary that the UK government conducts an evaluation of the impacts uh, that the economic, uh, what impact the economic impacts will have on their policy. Uh, it is necessary for them to publish these recommendations and for these recommendations to be true and honest and not just political voting items. Finally, uh, all human rights advocacy groups such as Salam and, um, must analyse these publications in depth. Understanding of government assumptions is necessary to be effective when lobbying. And that is the end. Thank you, Ethan. And I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Salam Advocacy Officer, and he's going to make his own comments for a few minutes. Then, please, Josh, you can moderate the rest of the session. By to make constant question to, to, to Ethan. So Ethan, please. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you Sorry. can make your comments. Okay, sure. Okay, so yeah, my name is Josh. I work with Salam as advocacy officer. So this topic very much uh, ties in with my I've been yeah, working with Ethan throughout his internship. So it's very, uh, yeah, um, a great moment seeing him present this in what is, in what is such a topic and which um, there's so many variables and it's uh yeah really uh, uh yeah not not an easy topic to grasp 
I think it, um, you did a fantastic job, and certainly as a, as our organisation's point of view, uh, yeah, seeing these findings will really help us uh, as we try and navigate in these sort of uncertain times. Um, so yeah, I've sort of got too many things prepared, but I guess just following uh, off that, um, we we'll just yeah, some we we'll just offer some reflections about that. Um, I think one theme that comes out in this um, is the uh, yeah the, the variable still um, still there, and I guess this UK's relationship with Bahrain doesn't come in a vacuum, and um, in the context of uh, yeah a hundred years of um, a sort of close relationship between the UK and the Bahraini ruling regime. Um, so I think we're not going to expect a huge rewriting of this relationship post Brexit, but it may be, um, yeah, in a positive way, uh, offers more um, or undermines um, the UK's already um, uh, kind of approach to foreign policy um, and human rights. As as the UK pivots um, more to other matters and stuff like that, um, so um, yeah, I would say that it, the findings are very important, and also underlines the importance of efforts to to change this course and this um, relationship. Because um, I say, on the country like Bahrain, there is thankfully. Um, some causes for optimism in that there are many activists such as Jawad Fairuz and others here in the UK working on these matters um, and there are um, there's increasing parliamentary support as Ethan pointed out there is quite a lot of interest on the UK's relationship with Bahrain with Saudi Arabia in light of the killing of Hashokshi so there is a sort of moment for assessment of UK's um, relationship with with some of these countries, particularly in the Gulf, um, and so yeah, even though the overall outlook is a bit, a bit bleak, um, there's yeah also some um, calls for optimism um, as well. So yeah, without further ado, I will. Um, uh, what are we doing? I see the door. Our comments and questions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So. Sure. Sure. So, um, does anyone have any questions about Ethan's presentation, or about the work of Salam, or anything yet yeah, to do with these topics, to do with human rights and the UK's foreign policy in the, the Middle East and the Gulf? Uh, yes, um, was, uh, I, said, I said about how there is, the UK needs to do more, uh, the question was about whether or not that's more from the public or from the government. Is that correct? That just correct to rephrase that? That's where the pressure on the government is coming from. Ah, right, I see. Uh, well, any source really is helpful. Um, obviously, we're about to go into a general election, so I suppose uh, from the public is probably the best at the moment. If the parties see there's a call for the government to be seen to be doing something, then I would imagine they would all promise to do something. That would be, yeah, my answer, take advantage of the fact there's going to be a general election in five weeks. Yeah, that's in the short term, obviously, in the long term. Pressure the government, uh, NGOs are obviously going to do all they can as they already do. So yes, I'd say from the public sphere is the most promising aspect. Yeah, I'm just being to myself. Also, the election, even though offers um, Challenges in that uh, parties and the whole public is so um, distracted by the, ele yeah, the election going on, but also offers a chance to kind of gain some promises, say from politicians or from parties in their manifesto, that they will yeah um, pledge certain things that matters, like yeah to sort of reassess their relationship with Bahrain or Saudi Arabia or something like that. So it all, yeah, it does offer some uh, opportunities as well. 
that's yeah, good question. Any other questions? Okay. We'll go to the next. Yeah, thank, thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ignan. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, thank you. Well done. Thank you. And uh, that's uh, okay. okay, we'll go for the next topic. And uh, here, uh, with the reaction of G20 states to the human rights and political developments, particularly in Bahrain. And to you, Sarah, and then uh, my colleague Rory, he's going to come and make his comments and moderate the session. Okay? You have